So as we get to the end of chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes, the teacher, Solomon, we're going on the assumption of, turns his quest towards work. He finds that it gives some meaning. It gives some satisfaction. It's normal. It's natural. But it's also a grind. Like all the other things, it doesn't provide ultimate satisfaction. Gary hates his job. The tasks are repetitive. Day in and day out, it's the same thing. The boss is grumpy. The other employees are always in conflict. But it's better than anything else he could find. But he feels trapped, like so many other people do. Nothing can be as frustrating at times as work. In part, this frustration goes all the way back to Adam and Eve and the punishment for their sin being the painful toil, the painful labor their work became. So why does work never work? Let's read from Ecclesiastes 2, 18 through 26. I hated all my work that I labored at under the sun, because I must leave it to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will take all my work that I labored at skillfully under the sun. This too is futile. So I began to give myself over to despair concerning all my work that I had labored at under the sun. When there is a person whose work was done with knowledge, wisdom, and skill, and he must give his portion to a person who has not worked for it, this too is futile and a great wrong. For what does a person get with all his work and all his efforts that he labors at under the sun? For all his days are filled with grief and his occupation is sorrowful. Even at night his mind does not rest. This too is futile. There is nothing better for a person than to eat, drink, and enjoy his work. I have seen that even this is from God's hand, because who can eat and who can enjoy life apart from him? For to the person who is pleasing in his sight, he gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and accumulating in order to give to the one who is pleasing in God's sight. This too is futile in a pursuit of the wind. Work will never work. Why? Well, let's kind of talk about the good and bad of work. Work is a big and natural part of life. It's usually one of the first things that we find out about each other when we meet new people, right? In our interactions, in our identifications, in our introductions, we say, hey, I'm a youth pastor, I'm a doctor, I'm a teacher, I'm a nurse, I'm whatever. It's usually a huge part of, of who we are. It's something that identifies people. We're defined by our work as a normal, natural, huge part of our lives. It's something that's important. It's something that matters. It's something that has value is meaningful, is beneficial, is beautiful in our lives. It's a wonderful thing. And a good work ethic is a strength for someone to have. Work can provide a lot of satisfaction. Solomon talks about this, the simple things, eating, drinking, enjoying life, working, come from the hand of God and bring us daily pleasure, bring us refreshment, bring us relaxation. As the king, he had been blessed with tremendous amounts of wealth. He had found satisfaction through his work. But like the pursuit of all these other things, it wasn't going to give him what he ultimately was looking for. It wasn't going to give him ultimate satisfaction. Like the parable of the rich man in the barns, you can store up all kinds of things, but eventually your life is going to be taken away. And those who store up on this life will find it all left behind at death. So work can provide satisfaction, but it can't provide ultimate meaning and purpose. It alone cannot provide all of what we're seeking. It leaves us empty inside. A lot of people go through the grind, 40-hour week, get to the weekend, only to repeat and do it all over again. A U.S. News and World Report study several years ago said work leads to insecurity, feeling unfulfilled, feeling unappreciated, even feeling crushed. Think about even people who accomplish great things. Someone named Hanna Monlikova was a, a tennis player, and she was once asked how it felt to defeat the great players of her era, like Martina Navratilova, Chris Everett Lloyd, people like that. She said this, any big win means that all the suffering, practice, and travel are worth it. I feel like I own the world. And then she was asked how long that feeling lasts, and she said about two minutes. It doesn't last. That satisfaction, that purpose, that meaning doesn't last. Why? Because apart from God, work leads to despair. What do I mean by that? A couple of things. One, work is hard. Verse 17, back before what I read, says work is distressing. It's hard. It's not meant to be cruise control easy. And that goes all the way back to the fall in Genesis 3. Man has to labor hard. Man has to work hard. And apart from God, it's a drudgery. It's a toil. It's an emptiness. The teacher, Solomon, says he hated it. It left him miserable. It left him empty. It left him with a void in his life. What we gain from our toil, from our work, is always left to those who come after us. We eventually have to leave it behind to people who come behind us. And those people may not care as much as we did. They haven't done anything to earn it. What a ripoff, right? He says he hated it. He says 
it, it, I mean, it's, it's left to those behind us who may or may not care. It eventually goes to ruin. We pour ourselves into work for nothing. What will it matter in 100 years when we exert all this effort, we accumulate all these things, we never really get to enjoy them anyway because we're working so hard to get them, and then we have to leave them for someone else. We have to leave them behind because you can't take it with you when you go. There's a reason you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul because you can't take it with you when you go. Keeping up with the Joneses is not worth it. You only control your wealth, your stuff for a season, and then it's out of your hands completely. At death, you withdraw your grip on all you've worked for, and it's other people's now. And then the third thing under this section, nothing is wasted when we do it from the Lord. Apart from him, it may all be empty, it may all be void, it may all be meaningless, it may all be pointless. But we set our mind on things above, not things of this world. The stuff of earth, it's like cotton candy. It's sugary, it's got this great seductive, attractive uh, appeal to it, but ultimately it's empty and unsatisfying calories, and that's that's how the thing is of this world is. Only what we do for the Lord lasts forever and is never in vain. So what can we take from this? What can we remember from this? First is this, everything we have is a gift entrusted to us by God. James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift comes from above. Psalm 50.10, Job 121 deal with the same idea. In fact, Job 121 says, we came into this world naked without anything and that's the way that we'll leave as well. We'll return that way as well. We don't take, we don't bring anything into the world. We don't take anything with us when we go. We are stewards charged by God to be faithful with all that he gives us. Um, Psalm 5010 says, every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. It's all his anyway. Nothing came from ourselves. It came from him. Second thing, God is the ultimate joy giver. Psalm 1611 deals with this. The gifts that he gives us are his way of creatively expressing and extending his love to us. He gives us joy. He gives us enlightenment through the things that he provides us. He alone will satisfy every longing. He alone will quench every thirst. He's not out to squash our joy. He's not out to squash our fun. He is the joy giver. So because of that, mm -hmm. enjoy nice things, but don't make those things supreme. Build what you want. Save what you might. Put it in the bank. Liquefy it into stocks and bonds. Drop it into real estate. Put it anywhere that you choose, but don't make it supreme. Don't make it of ultimate value. The accumulation of wealth doesn't produce anything that lasts for eternity. That mountain of money, that stuff becomes meaningless two seconds after death. Don't clutch the stuff. Don't clench the stuff, but leave your hands open for God to use the stuff he, he blesses you with, the gifts, the wealth, the things that he gives you. Keep God at the center of your bank account, your possessions, your portfolios. In Jesus, there is no meaningless work. There is no unimportant labor. Everything's seen, everything's noted, everything is rewarded, everything's blessed in and by him. But outside of Jesus, there is no blessing. There is no meaning, there is no satisfaction, there is no reward. There's emptiness and futility, just like with all these other things. Workaholism doesn't provide satisfaction any more than laziness does. Don't chase after meaning and purpose in work or even in the things that work gets us and does for us. It's all a gift from God and ultimate satisfaction, meaning and purpose comes from the giver not from the gift. Enjoy your work, work hard, enjoy the stuff work provides, but don't let it become supreme. Only one is meant to be supreme, and that's where you'll find meaning, happiness, satisfaction, joy, life.